Now, I was very fortunate to, to be at an institution, at the Botanical Museum at Harvard, when, um, because whenever I got restless, there was always a new assignment. And after many years in South America, uh, I was looking for a new challenge. And one day, Schultes called me to his fourth floor at Erie and asked me very casually whether I was interested in going down to Haiti to infiltrate the secret societies and secure the drugs used to make zombies. Well, naturally, I said yes. <laughs> And I left within a fortnight Cambridge thinking that this was going to be some kind of lark that would consume a, a couple of weeks in a miserable Boston winter, having no idea that it would consume four years of my life because within 24 hours of arriving in the African reality, I had something available to me that had eluded me for four years in the Amazon, and that was truly a window wide open to the mystic. And it's interesting, I don't want to dwell on this this afternoon, but if, you, if I ask you to name the great religions of the world, what do you say? Christianity, Buddhism, Judaism, Islam, uh, whatever, there's always a continent left out, sub-Saharan Africa, the tacit assumption being that African people had no religious beliefs. Well, of course, by ethnographic de uh, definition they did, voodoo is not a black magic cult. It's a complex series of spiritual ideas that were distilled during the wake of the tragic diaspora in the new world, and the fundamental essence of the faith is this idea that the dead, uh, the living give birth to the dead, the dead in this quintessentially democratic faith must serve the living, to serve the living they must become manifest, to become manifest as spirits, they must respond to the power of the chant and the rhythm of the drum, to return to the material world, to momentarily displace the soul of the living, so for that brief shining moment, the human being and the God become one and the same. This is what spirit possession is. This is this moment of divine grace. And so when you see theatrical gestures in the community-based religion in Benin or Togo, uh, before a fetish symbol, an individual cutting into his skin, or more profoundly, in Haiti, voodoo acolytes in a state of trance, handling burning embers with impunity. These are not deliberate gestures of the, sen of the sensation. These are ways of people showing the power of faith, because when you are taken by the god, how can a god be harmed? And for me, this was a real revelation, because I think more than anything I had experienced in South America, witnessing the power of voodoo uh, and the power of African faith the extraordinary ability of the mind to affect the body that bore it uh, suggested to me the power of culture to define the individual. And it reinforced this powerful idea that these other cultures are not failed attempts at being us. They're unique answers to a fundamental question. What does it mean to be human and alive? And as we see, when asked that question, people respond with 7,000 different voices, and those collectively become our human repertoire. And the converse of that, this sort of condensation to monoculture, is a disturbing trend indeed. And I want to stress that the problem is not change. All peoples through all time have always been dancing with new possibilities for life. Nor is the challenge to the integrity of the ethnosphere technological. Uh, the Lakota Sioux did not stop being Lakota when they gave up the bow and arrow for the rifle any more than an American farmer ceased being American when they gave up the horse and buggy in favor of the automobile. It's neither change nor technology that threatens the integrity of culture. We have this idea that these peoples are somehow quaint and colorful but destined to fade away as if by natural law, as if they're failed attempts at being us, failed attempts at being modern. Nothing could be further from the truth. In every case, these are dynamic living peoples being driven out of existence by very concrete and identifiable forces, which is actually an optimistic observation because it suggests if human beings are the agents of cultural destruction, we can be the facilitators of cultural survival. Now, what's afflicting cultures around the world can be biological in the case of diseases sweeping into the homeland of the Yanomami as they did at the time of contact, and they can also be industrial. I wrote a book about my voodoo experience that, uh, called The Serpent and the Rainbow that was made into the worst Hollywood movie in history. Uh, and Hemingway said that if you sell a book to Hollywood, you should start off in Arizona, drive to the California state line, throw your book over, and then go back to Tucson and have a drink. Uh, <laughs> I didn't do that. I kind of escaped to the forests of Borneo. I always wanted to live with a, in a place wet with the innocence of birth. I wanted to live in a nomadic society, and I chose the Penan, the last nomadic people of Southeast Asia. And I was intrigued by this because, of course, nomadic 
societies echo what we all once were. It was only with the Neolithic that we succumbed to the cult of the seed. And nomads are profoundly different. How do you measure wealth in a society in which everything has to be carried on your back, in which everybody knows how to make everything, and which has no incentive to accumulate material possessions? Well, the measure of wealth is literally the strength of social relations between people. Because if those flay or, or fail, everybody suffers. By the same token, sharing becomes an involuntary reflex because you never know who will be the next to bring food to the table. I once gave a cigarette to a Penan woman and watched as she tore it apart to distribute equitably the strands of tobacco to each hut in the encampment, rendering the product useless, honoring her obligation to share. And in these societies, too, they're non written societies, they're oral traditions, and I've always noticed that in the same way that we can hear voices when we read a Victorian novel, uh, peoples in a non-written tradition seem to hear the echo of sounds in nature, so that the flight of a hornbill becomes a kind of cursive script of nature, like a vocabulary written on the wind. Unfortunately, by the time I got to Borneo, the sounds of the forest had become the sounds of machinery, because this area suffered the highest rate of tropical deforestation in the 1980s, and so overnight, a way of life was turned over. Women were suddenly working as prostitutes and servants in logging camps that put so much silt into the rivers of Borneo that it sometimes seemed as if all of uh, Borneo was slipping to the South China Sea where the Japanese freighters hung light on the horizon ready to fill their hold with raw logs ripped from the heart of the forest. Women suddenly forced into settlement camps, men overwhelmed, uh, re resisting a uh, quixotic gesture, blowpipes against bulldozers, but ultimately no, no match for the power of the Malaysian state. And now the last of the Penan has settled and a way of life inherently inspired uh, is no more in the forest. Now these kind of industrial intrusions don't simply occur in distant places. This is a very close friend of mine from where I live in British Columbia, where by an incredible miracle of geography, three of our most important salmon rivers, the Skeena, the Nass, and the Stikin, are all born in a, a meadow that to the Indians is called, the First Nations, is called the Sacred Headwaters. Now the only place I know where such a miracle occurs is on the slopes of Mount Kailash where the Indus, the Brahmaputra, and the Ganges are seen to be born. And not, that area is considered so sacrosanct to two and three billion Jains, Buddhists, and Hindus that not only are you not allowed to climb Kailash, you're not allowed to step on its slope. And the idea of imposing industrial infrastructure would be so anathema that it would doom your life and your clan and your lineage for all eternity. We in North America treat the land very different. And in the very meadows that give birth to the sacred headwaters, Royal Dutch Shell is proposing to explore for coal bed methane gas, which will mean a network of several thousand wells connected by pipes, roads, etc. What I find interesting about this is not simply the, the environmental issues at stake, but what it tells us about a people. Think about this. We take this as a given, but this very anomalous in human affairs. In order to do this, all you have to do is to cobble together a company online, a company that has less history than my dog, and suddenly you can approach the government. And as long as you promise the government a revenue flow through taxation or royalties and a certain level of employment, you can get the tenure. But what, what about the land itself? According to our economic model, there is no line item in the calculus of economic planning that takes into account either the inherent value of the land or the cost to the commons inherent in its desecration. Now, we take that as a given. It's the foundation of the industrial model of extraction on the planet, but it's hugely anomalous in the affairs of human beings. And this is where I think we have to look elsewhere for other possibilities and other thoughts. 